Hey guys, Tom here. Uh, just before we get into today's video, I just want to give a quick shout out to Hatch Invest. So uh, you may have seen a video I've done on them before around their US investing platform. Uh, they've recently actually did a case study on me. So if you want to go and have a read of that, uh, feel free. I don't typically reveal what stocks or anything I own on this YouTube channel. I don't think I've ever done that, but I actually did reveal a couple in this one. So if you're interested in that, uh, don't take them as stock tips or anything like that. But if you're interested, go and, go and check that out. Uh, but for now, let's get into the video. Cheers. Hey guys, Tom here from the Investing with Tom YouTube channel. Welcome back to the channel. Uh, today we're going to go through a Q&A video and I just had a quick look back and it's actually been like six months since I've done one of these videos. So it doesn't even feel like I've had a YouTube channel for six months, but um, it's been a little while since I've done one of these. So um, thanks to everyone who left questions on the previous video. If you want your questions answered in the next Q&A video that I do, then drop them down below and I'll be sure to get to those next time we do one of these. So um, I'm going to dive straight in so first question is from Shannon Hudson hey Tom what are the best apps to monitor the NZX so um, at the moment to be honest my portfolio really has almost nothing in New Zealand which sounds weird for a New Zealand investor so um, actually all I own in New Zealand at the moment is the New Zealand top 50 index so um, I don't own in any individual companies I did uh, when I first started out and when I first started out uh, I had no idea what I was doing and I kind of just picked those companies because I thought they might do well over the next year or, or something like that. So um, I really don't use any apps to monitor uh, NZX companies. Uh, what I do generally do is if something major is happening with the company and and the stock price is coming down quite dramatically that's usually the the kind of time where I tend to look quite hard at the business and see you know am I able to get quite a good deal at the moment um, and typically I'm able to see that you know just in the news I follow the news pretty closely and and when big companies are having issues that usually uh, comes on my radar so um, that's the first place I tend to find things. As far as apps that I use, I basically use Yahoo Finance for almost everything. So that's where I, uh, I've got my portfolio set up and I, I track, you know, what it's doing week to week kind of thing. Um, that allows me to set up a portfolio with with stocks and, and different currencies and things and report it all in New Zealand dollars. So I find that really useful. And then I also use the Yahoo Finance, uh, still the app as well, but I also use the website quite a lot for just getting some quick stats within a couple of minutes on a company. So if I want to look at some real basic stuff like what's their uh, current earnings, current cash flows, what are they forecast to grow out over the next five years by analysts, uh, what's their return on equity, return on invested capital, debt levels, all that kind of stuff. Um, just some basic kind of stats to, to let me see a bit of an overview of that business. I basically always go to Yahoo Finance for that. So um, sorry I can't help you with app suggestions or anything there, but that's my usual go-to. So next question is from Lewis Paz. So shout out to Lewis. If you can see the larger version, I've got two copies of it, but the larger version here of Payback Time by Phil Town. Lewis actually sent me that and it's signed by Phil Town. Uh, so thank you very much for that, Lewis. Uh, got a few questions mixed in here uh, and quite a, quite a long sort of comment, but I'm going to try and uh, narrow this down. So um, basically Lewis is saying when he first uh, started investing in the, in the stock market, he naively thought that every time you buy shares, that money goes directly to the company. Uh, and if you sell shares, the, the money is taken away from the company. And like we spoke about in the previous video, the only time a company really benefits from going public is when they first go public. So they get a whole bunch of cash up front by issuing shares, um, you know, pieces of ownership in that business. And then from that point on, they really don't have uh, a huge amount of benefit by what happens day to day or month to month or year to year in their actual stock price. So um, Lewis is asking, you know, what, what happens with the money when we actually buy shares? Does it get held by a broker or, or what happens there? Uh, am I overthinking it? So uh, Lewis, yes, you're definitely overthinking it. Um, basically, anytime you buy shares, uh, it's just like a transaction of any other asset. When you buy shares in Chipotle uh, or when you sell shares in, in a business, there is someone else on the other end of that trade. So if you buy 100 shares in a business, somebody has to sell 100 shares in a business for that transaction to happen so um, the broker's not not holding on to the money or anything like that if you think about it like a house um, 
you know, if you if you go and buy a house, that, that house has some sort of value. If you go and buy a house, uh, someone has to sell you that house for that transaction to happen, right? So it's exactly the same in the stock market. Uh, if the price of that stock goes goes down or goes up, uh, there's and no one's buying or selling, say, just to, to keep things simple, um, the price wouldn't move if no one was selling, but just bear with me on this. So uh, if the price comes down, that doesn't mean that, you know, there's there's cash flowing anywhere. Just, just think about it like a house, right? Um, if you own a house and the value on paper of that house goes up or down, uh, there's no movement of cash or anything. It's just what that is worth in the market at the moment. So um, every time you buy or sell a stock, there's someone else on the other end of that transaction. So um, no more complicated than that. Uh, second question from Lewis. So, uh, did I go to school for learning about investing? Uh, am I self-taught? Uh, where's all this info coming from? So, um, I have zero uh, formal informa- formal education in investing or finance or anything like that. Uh, I did a couple of. I think I might have done maybe one economics paper at uni, like a real basic one um, but basically all everything that I know about investing has either come from uh, reading or YouTube basically so I listen to a lot of podcasts a lot of YouTube um, really just trying to learn as much as I can um, I'm actually working my way through the old Berkshire Hathaway annual meetings at the moment so um, they are on YouTube and on um, I think it's buffett.cnbc.com you can see all those annual meetings of Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway uh, back to 1994 so I've listened from 1994 and I think I'm up to 2012, almost 2013 at the moment. So a lot of content to pick up there, but but basically it's just reading and, and reading every day pretty much. Um, I try to pick up as much knowledge from, from various um, sources as I can. And, and like I've said a few times, I think um, with any endeavor, but investing in particular, it's all about getting a whole bunch of competing thoughts kind of up in your brain and, and, and having to kind of think through which approach you think is the most effective one and, and the one that you can stick to over the long term. So um, to answer your question, really no formal education in investing or anything like that. Uh, completely self-taught, uh, either by watching other people like myself that, that make YouTube videos or reading podcasts, um, all those sorts of things. All right, next question. So Heidi asks, what are your thoughts on peer-to-peer lending platforms such as Harmony and Squirrel? So uh, I have never looked for like five minutes at at, um, peer-to-peer lending, to be honest. So um, thank you for your question, Heidi, but I really can't give you much of an opinion at all on that one, to be honest with you. Uh, next one. So another question from Shannon Hudson, actually. So, um, nice one. How about can South for some speculation? So, uh, I think the answer to your question is in the question. It's about as speculative as it gets. Uh, Canna South is probably the company I get asked about more than any other company, especially over the last two or three months. So, um, I actually, fun fact, filmed a video on Canna South like three days ago, but I just thought it turned out terrible. So I, I haven't posted it. Um, but if you'd like me to, if you'd like to see that one, maybe let me know. But uh, my basic thoughts are this. So if you don't know uh, Canna South, they are a company based in New Zealand that recently went public. Um, they raised about $10 million in the IPO and they specialize in uh, medicinal cannabis. And at the moment, there's um, they're basically the definition of speculation right now. So um, if we try and define uh, an investment versus a speculation, an investment is something where we can uh, reasonably confidently predict the returns we're going to get because we know what the cash flows of that business are going to be and we can compare that to the price that we're paying for that company. And then on the other hand, speculation is basically everything else. So I would put into the category of speculation something, um, maybe something very cyclical potentially, um, sort of depends what price you're paying. If it's very, very cheap and it's cyclical and you'll still make money kind of in a bad year, um, that can that can still be a good investment. But basically something that you can't accurately predict the returns that you're gonna get from is typically something I'd put in the speculation category. Um, and then when you look at Canna South, uh, a lot of these cannabis companies around the world are not profitable. They, they may have decent revenues, but they're not profitable. Canna South doesn't even have a, have any revenue. They are literally selling zero dollars of product right now. Um, they have got licenses to, to import cannabis seed from the Netherlands to grow cannabis and do their trials for and research for, for medicinal 
kind of cannabis um, products. But after those trials are complete, they have to destroy all of the plant material. So um, they can't sell anything. So to answer your question, uh, I'm not going anywhere near Canna South, I think. Um, the basic stats are they've got $10 million in cash. They're probably going to lose anywhere from $1 to $1.2 million this year. Um, zero revenue, and they have a $90 million valuation. So that's not something I'm going to touch. Uh, that's not to say it might might do well in the future. Um, and please don't come back to me in, in two or three months time and say, you know, Canna South's up 50%, you're, you're an idiot or anything like that. Uh, anything can happen in the short term. Uh, what I really care about with my investments is what's happening in three, five, 10, 20 years time. So come back to me in five or 10 years time and, and Canna South, uh, if it's doing well, then you can tell me I was wrong, but please don't come back in, in three months and say that. So um, thanks for the question, Shannon. A uh, question from Carlos Dougal, what are the hidden costs in mutual funds? So one of my oldest videos actually is um, on this on this topic of mutual funds. That was back when I was getting about 10 views or something on videos. So not many, not many people probably saw it. Um, but there's a lot of hidden costs in mutual funds and it's really the main reason why, um, not financial advice, but typically I, I tend to prefer ETFs and index funds versus mutual funds because what typically happens in a mutual fund is they try to manage themselves so conservatively uh, anyway that the returns that they get um, basically mirror the the returns you might get from an index investment like an S&P 500 or a New Zealand Top 50 or a Dow Jones. Um, typically the, the before fee returns are very close to that. They may be one or two percent either side. Um, over the long term they're typically um, kind of slightly lagging behind the, the indices. So uh, you can get that market level return by just investing in a low low cost ETF. Uh, and mutual funds have a lot of fees in there. So they have um, basically management fees. So, so a very typical, uh, this is probably getting a bit more into the hedge fund world, but a typical hedge fund structure is two and 20. So they take 2% of assets under management just as a off the top straight away as a fee. And then they'll take 20% of any profits that they make for you. So um, those fees can do horrendous things for your returns over the long term. Like if even if we only take the 2% and, and forget about the 20% performance stuff, um, if the if they make an 8% return and the market also does an 8% return, investors are only actually making a 6% return if they're taking off a 2% fee. And if you run that, run those numbers through a compounding calculator, um, over a 40 year period, it can literally, that 2% difference, which, which sounds relatively minor, that can literally cut your retirement in half. You can have 50% of the am amount of money that you could have had if you invested in something with lower fees. So um, in terms of mutual fund fees, management fees are the big one. They have a lot of trading costs. So um, simple brokerage fees when they're buying and selling um, securities uh, because they are typically selling and buying and selling things quite frequently for whatever reason. And the other thing that comes along with that in certain countries, uh, New Zealand not so much, but in the States especially, is when you, buy, is when you sell a stock um, within 12 months of owning it, you actually pay a much higher capital gains tax rate than if you would have held that for longer than 12 months. So um, again, there's some, there's some profits kind of chewed up with that. And all of this stuff tends to just add up to a pretty bad experience. So um, that's a little bit on the hidden costs of mutual funds. So thank you very much for your questions. That's all I've got here for today. So if you want to get your questions answered in a future video, as I said, drop them in the comments down below and I will definitely get around to those. So let me know if you, you enjoy these styles of, of video videos or not. Uh, if you do, I can definitely film more of them. They're, they're pretty easy to film. I don't have to usually do much prep work or thinking before I dive into them, which is nice. So um, if you do enjoy these videos, let me know. Um, drop some questions and comments and things down below and you may well be in the next video. So hope you enjoyed it and have a great day. Cheers.